Hello, everybody. Welcome to Brave New Conversations. My name is Jim Miller, and today I am excited to welcome Mark Rudd. Uh, Mark Rudd, for those of you who aren't aware, is a uh, icon of the 60s anti-war movement. Uh, yes, an icon, and, and so much so that Gary Trudeau in Doonesbury immortalized Mark's organizing skills with a character, Megaphone Mark. Right, and uh, I, I was 20 years old at the time. 20 years Imagine old. Imagine what that does to your head. You know? <laughs> well, well, let's start at the beginning yeah. then. You, you know, I know as a freshman at Columbia University, you, you did some youth mentoring programs. Was that your first foray into public service? What, what motivated Probably you? Probably it was, come to think of it. We, um, a lot of the um, uh, students at Columbia at that time uh, were involved in this uh, program, going into Harlem and tutoring. Columbia being on the edge of Harlem, and it was, it was kind of a, what you might call a liberal social service program. It, it, uh, um, but I think the biggest effect was on the Columbia students mm -hmm. to make us aware of Harlem and right there, the, the capital of black America, right next door to Columbia. And so to continue that conversation, you, uh, the fact that you were right next door to Harlem was, I think, instrumental in what happened in, in April of 1968. Oh, very much so. Tell me first, how did you become the, the voice and the face of, of this movement in Colombia? Well, a lot, that was the decision of the media. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, New York being the media capital of the, of the empire, um, they chose, they, they, they were looking for one person. I happened to be the newly elected chair of the Columbia chapter of SDS, Students for Democratic Society. Mm -hmm. and. Um, I was um, very militant, fiery, young. I was just 20 years old. Um, they chose me. It, it kind of did screw with my head a bit. Also, and I write about that in the book, but, but the one element that got the most distorted uh, out of that media coverage mm -hmm. was the fact that uh, the black students at Columbia played a leading role right. in seizing one of the buildings. And they did that as representatives of the Harlem community. And they never got credit for their courage and for their, their what you might call vanguard action. Instead, Mark Rudd, the white kid from the suburbs, and SDS, a basically white organization, uh, became associated with uh, uh, the Columbia strike. So let's talk about, you know, you, you speak about it in the book, and, and I wanted to say this at the, at the beginning, that the book is underground. If you haven't gotten it and read it yet, you should. It's, it's Out in it's, paperback. And it's out in paperback. And you can so. get the um, remainders from Amazon at cheaper than the paperback. So <laughs> Steal this book, basically. <laughs> um, let, let's talk about what the the events that led up to to the strike and, and how it came about. Well, what I try to do in the story is, in the book, is get across the fact that it was many years of organizing on the mm -hmm. Columbia campus that led up to the strike uh, of, of uh, the spring of 1968. Um, knocking on doors, uh, holding educational forums, all night teach-ins, um, teaching ourselves and teaching the campus about the nature of the war, uh, also the nature of racism. Um, Columbia, uh, in the years mm, 65 to 68 when I was there, but even before, was, was kind of a, a place with a, um, where, where politics was, was swirling around, especially because of the influence of Harlem. Malcolm X often came to Columbia and spoke. What we created in our organizing was, was a kind of a radicalization of the campus in the sense that people were asking the question, how does the war affect me? Mm -hmm. How does racism affect me in this mostly white institution? How does the university's participation in the war and racism matter to me? And that was the radicalization that was kind of like the seedbed. Um, the great organizer Ella uh, uh, Baker of SNCC uh, talks about doing the spade work, many mm -hmm. years of doing the spade work. The actual events of the spring of 68 um, uh, created a kind of a perfect storm. It was bam, bam, bam. Um, uh, end of January to end of March, the Vietnamese hit um, American bases in, in over 160 cities in Vietnam, 
giving the lie to the, the administration military line that, the, that they were winning the war. The Tet um, Offensive. The Tet Offensive, correct. And, and during that two-month period, um, public opinion on the war flipped right. from two, approximately two-thirds for the war to approximately two-thirds against. It was, it was an amazing change in a short period of time. Actually, not that different from what happened in 2006 when the American people realized that the war in Iraq could not mm -hmm. be won. Um, March 31st, 68, LBJ, the, the, the reigning president who was, had pushed the war, um, announced that he was going to seek talks with the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, and um, he would not run again, which was really a great victory right. for the anti-war movement. And there's a lot to be said about that, but uh, that, was, that was a stunning event. Then, just four days later, Martin Luther King was assassinated mm -hmm. in Memphis. And Harlem blew up. I mean, I talk in the book about standing, overlooking Harlem at Columbia, uh, overlooking uh, Morningside Park, and seeing dozens of fires and fire engines. And it was right there, the revolt, the spontaneous outburst of, of, of the people of Harlem. Uh, was right there. A friend and I just raced down into Harlem to, 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 um, uh, to, to experience it. And, right. and, and everyone, black, white, didn't matter who you were, at that moment had to rethink what our personal relationship was to racism. So this, this created a kind of a perfect storm where uh, certain events around discipline, uh, around the building of a gym uh, uh, in public land, uh, all came together on April 23rd, 68, and an explosion happened, more or less spontaneously. Now, it, it, race, class, and war seems to be a running theme. In, in 1965, was there, or 68, was there a difference, or was it all the, the same fight? Well, the, the civil rights movement had actually, um, the official civil rights movement, as led by Martin Luther King, had actually stayed out of criticism of the Vietnam War until April of 67, when, when Martin Luther King finally spoke out against the war. But the radicals in SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, had, had been talking about uh, the war as a racist enterprise and as a colonial war uh, since much earlier. And so, yes, um, the, w what had happened was, during that period, young people were being radicalized in mm -hmm. the sense of of asking what are the roots of this problem? Is the Vietnam War, for example, a well-meant effort? Mm -hmm. Or is there something else? And our conclusion was that it was part of an imperialist uh, um, attempt to dominate the world. Still, I, I'm, I'm still an anti-imperialist to this day. But um, racism, uh, is, is part of, of imperialism, and so is the class nature of our society. Many of us became aware during that period of the privileges that come from being white in the society, or the privileges that come from going to a place like Colombia. Right, right. So that's class issues. And so what happened from there is basically April 23rd, and, and you, you occupied five different buildings. There was, the whole city was involved, the whole country, and then the whole world, as you talk in, in the book, Paris, and uh, there's other well, cities. Well, I'm not sure Colombia started the, the, the revolt in, of May, June in, in France, but that was, that was a period of revolt throughout the world. It's true. So let's get back to the organizing part of it. Um, so there was years of organizing involved here. How day to day and how different was the organizing when you were in the moment? What did you have to do in order to keep what control you, you had of the situation? I'm not sure that there was ever any control of mm -hmm. the situation. In a way it got out of control in the sense that events and, 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 and people's passions and desires were way beyond what, what, what the so-called leaders of SDS could postulate as strategy. Um, Prior to April 68, SDS had been involved a lot in the problem of base building. Mm -hmm. How do we grow our numbers? How do we educate more people? How do we involve more people? How do we get more people 
um, to, to rethink who they are and to, and to um, become active. And, and this, this, I think this was the right concern. Um, however, th through the militancy of a few people taking action, a crisis was created, mm -hmm. especially with the administration um, reaction of calling the police. Thousands joined all of a sudden. So uh, the situation was way out of um, what you might call strategic planning. It, it was, it was a, a moment when people came forward. And then, then the leaders had to catch up. I describe a number of, of times when I didn't know what was going to happen. And um, people would yell, let's go down to the gym site and tear the fence down. And then I think about it, and people, and I say, yeah, let's go to the <laughs> gym site. So, no, uh, the leaders, at that time, the leaders were struggling to catch up. There were, though, a lot of, and we spoke about this briefly, there was a lot of different organizations during that time, a lot of active youth organizations. And, you know, comparing to what's happening today, we have two wars, nine and, and seven years old, mm -hmm. and there doesn't seem to be the same level of enthusiasm, especially from the youth, mm -hmm. to end these conflicts. In 2003, there was an enormous, spontaneous outpouring of, of, of sentiment against the war. Mm -hmm. Thousands of people were in the streets. In Albuquerque, New Mexico, where, where I live, I participated in a demonstration of 5,000 people marching from the university to a park downtown. At least half of them were students. And this, this spontaneous feeling, was it, was it was real, but it wasn't organized for the long run. Mm -hmm. So what happened was all the Bush administration had to do was ignore it. Because we weren't organized for political power, we weren't organized to run candidates, we weren't organized to build a, a, a sustained movement over years, and a lot of people went home. Right. People got tired of, of demonstrating. Demonstrating became a cliche. We didn't substitute the long-term strategic organizing that had been there at the, at the, all throughout the Vietnam War. And my analysis of it is that we had the advantage back then of the example given us by the civil rights movement, and, and before that by the labor movement. Civil rights movement was, was not a spontaneous phenomenon, and it did not cons consist of merely mass mobilizations. It was a lot of spade work, of groundwork, of knocking on doors, of, of, of church meetings, of getting people involved. And, and that happened throughout the 60s to, uh, 1960 to 65. But it gave us the model for organizing. Mm -hmm. And then when the, when the anti-war movement jumped off around 65, I'm 18 years old, I get to Columbia University from Maplewood, New Jersey, um, that's what's happening, is organizing. We don't have that organizing model now. There's many other differences, too. Um, one being uh, that, that the, um, the culture now emphasizes mm, entertainment and, of course, material consumption in a way that, that wasn't true 45 years ago. There, were, there was still a, a kind of a civic involvement mm -hmm. um, that, that still was a remnant of the New Deal era and the World War II era. Uh, it, it wasn't square or, or crazy to be involved in politics. It made a lot of sense. Now people um, maybe are, are, are quite a bit jaded about the effects of all of that. Um, one other major difference, of course, is the draft. Mm -hmm. And what the draft did was it focused a lot of people's attention on the war. Now if you're, there's no draft, there's an economic conscription system, but if, if you're not in the lower classes that are, are, are conscripted in that manner, then you, know, you can ignore the, the war. So there, there are many differences, but the one I emphasize is, is the lack of that model mm -hmm. of organizing. And that's actually why I wrote my book. To help to organize. Well, to help give that model. The right. first part of the book is about good organizing right. um, at Columbia. Uh, leading up to, to 65, uh, from 65 to 68. The second part of the book is about 
how that good organizing turned bad in our heads. Mm -hmm. And we got the notion that if we merely express ourselves, for example, express our militancy against the system in the form of going out and fighting cops, which is what we did in October of 69, and, and actually there was a lot of that, um, that that would be enough to build a movement. It wasn't. That kind of self-expression is not the same as organizing. It could become part of organizing, but it's not the same. Then it got even worse. And, and the weather underground, the bombings, and the, the notion of building a, a clandestine underground uh, guerrilla army, that was pure fantasy. Mm -hmm. and, and so we left organizing. We abandoned the college campuses. So in a way, this, this, this book is a, is a, was written as, a, as a, a case study of what not to do. <laughs> The, the, the things that the civil rights movement did in the labor movement be, before them with the direct contact and door to door. You mentioned now how things are different. With new media, is there a model in, in your opinion be. that could work? I don't know. I, that's still to be developed. I mean, we have a tendency with, with our uh, use of the internet to to be talking to the to those who already agree with us, mm -hmm. you know, and and part of the organizing that took place for all for all of these, um, the growth of of all the social movements uh, in the 20th century, involved talking to people who weren't like us. Also, one other aspect of, of organizing is coalition building. Right, bringing in, for example, the the anti-war movement was a was a great coalition of church people. Uh, so was the civil rights movement of 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 adult uh, liberals of 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 pacifists union people huge coalition i i would like to see that happen again I, it's going to be necessary for any social movement i don't know if that's possible given the kind of separation that exists on the internet between different groupings on the other hand uh, you can you can use social networking to call out a lot more people. I mean, we use primitive technology right. involving a wax, a piece of a paper with wax, and we'd use a stylus that was developed in Babylonia to <laughs> make headlines on the wax, and then you'd put that on a machine. Uh, which nobody knows about now, but it's called a mimeograph. Mm -hmm. And you turn a crank or you push a button and the motor would go and, 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 we, we, and the result would be a piece of paper, if you could believe such a thing. And we'd have to take that paper out to a street corner and hand it to people. But when we handed it to people, we'd talk to them right. you know, about the piece of paper. You know, I mean, when I think of, of how primitive our technology was, I actually do remember looking out the window out on Broadway from Columbia and seeing dinosaurs uh, <laughs> roaming down the streets. I mean, it was that primitive. Um, but um, that was, it was hard to get in touch with people. Right. You know, you'd have to call them on the phone, but there were no answering machines right. at that time. They had to be home to get the call. So um, um, you can mobilize people a lot quicker, that's for sure. Right. And you can get a lot of information out there. Um, and, and I think that, 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 I mean, there's many benefits. I'll give you, I'll give you one concrete example. Abu Ghraib mm -hmm. came out, the torture at Abu Ghraib came out, uh, I believe it was 04 or 05. Uh, in other words, within about a year of the actual events, mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the photos made it out onto the web. Well, the United States had a similar torture program uh, in, Vietnam, in Vietnam. It was called Operation Phoenix. Mm -hmm. And it involved kidnapping thousands of people, torturing them, and then murdering them. And, and, but we didn't know about Operation Phoenix till, till the end of the war. Um, and so here we had the war in Iraq, and within a year of the, the actual torture program, we knew all about it, right. whereas it took a lot longer. So, I mean, the, the, the access to information is, is, is wonderful now. It's a great advantage. But, but the question still arises, how are we going to talk to people who are not like us? Right. And the society is a little different now because there's so much 
segregation and differentiation, it's almost impossible for people to talk, even with people who are like us. You know, it's just we don't talk. You know, mm. but to, but to go and for me to go to an evangelical church and to talk with the evangelicals about the, what what what's bothering them, or to go to Tea Party people and talk, it, it's out of the question. Nobody wants to talk to each other now. Yeah. Let's go back to the access of information that you spoke about. In the book, you write about um, some media distortions that happened several times uh, with, with SDS, with Weatherman, with, with you know, situations that you were in. Yeah. Now, the media, there's a lot more access. There's 24-hour cable news networks. Do you think that the reporting has gotten any better, or, or is the media still distorting things, or is it the government that's giving them distortions? What? Well, in, in the case of Columbia and the... Um, uh, the media coverage, uh, primarily, um, for example, the New York Times. Mm -hmm. um, the New York Times uh, publishing family, the, pu the family of the publishers and, and the editorial staff were well represented on the board right. of uh, Columbia, Columbia's uh, uh, board of trustees. There's a conflict of interest. Absolutely. Uh, same with the uh, DA was on the board of trustees. So they had an agenda. I, I think there's, there's still plenty of agendas running around. For example, corporations that are uh, involved in uh, uh, defense uh, work that, that, that are also um, um, owning uh, uh, military, or, or rather uh, media uh, outlets, certainly um, don't want to question the war system that we have and bring out the idea of international law as an alternative to war and military production. So. I mean, certain questions are, are, are off limits, obviously. Um, we could never, for example, uh, imagine that a, a reporter would ask a candidate for president about the possibility of taking money from the military budget and turning it into social needs. Such questions are completely uh, off limits. Right. Um, and I think there are key corporate interests that, that are part of this. Um, but I think a bigger question is with the audience now. Mm -hmm. Do people want data and facts that are objective? Or do they only, the few people who are interested, do they only want data that justifies or, or rationalizes or supports their preconceived ideology or notions? That's a big problem. Um, I don't, for example, um, I watch CNBC. Or, and I watch Fox News, and they're both, you know, pushing their lines. Right. Where does someone go to figure out what's happening? There's nowhere. You know? That's the sad state. Well, you can go to Brave New Films, and we have That's all the, the I was going to say. We, we go to Brave New Films. You know, I want to ask you, I have time for just one more question. Right now, we are in the middle of two wars, as we've talked about. You're somebody who has experienced very closely what happened with Vietnam. You, you lived it. Do you believe with Iraq and Afghanistan that it's also a colonial, imperialistic? A absolutely. Um, we have hundreds of bases all around the world. Um, I'm, I'm, I follow Noam Chomsky, mm -hmm. and, and Chomsky for many decades has been saying quite accurately, uh, the goal of the United States is global domination. That's why we race to war. We could have, for example, um, treated terrorism or acts of violence as criminal matters, the way the Europeans typically have in the last decade. Uh, and, and those criminal actions are then dealt with through police means and international law. That would have been a perfectly rational and probably more effective way of dealing it, with it. But the goal was war, because that projects our power around the world. Chomsky used to say, the goal of the United States is global domination. In the last 10 years, he's been saying, the goal of the United States is global domination through the use of violence. Hmm. That makes war the goal mm -hmm. rather than the means. We need war to justify our military production. Our economy is sustained by military spending. We are a military Keynesian state. We need war. It's a horrible thing to consider because the American people have never 
voted on this. We've never talked about it. It's the system we have. It's why Obama, who I think by inclination is a peacemaker, when he gets in power, he has to push war in Afghanistan. It's crazy, but that's the system we have. There is an alternative. It's international law. But we don't, we're not allowed to even consider what international law might look like because we are so committed to war. The Europeans, on the other hand, have had so much war that they're disgusted by it. Actually, they've had so much war and religion that they're disgusted by both, and they've turned away from both. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're you know, some decades behind Europe, but, but I think that, that, that the future, the 21st century, is going to be the century where we either get international law or we have global destruction. Is there anything that we can do? I mean, we're not voting Everything. on this, but what, what, what do you suggest people that are watching do in order well, to change the situation? Every individual has a passion. Mm -hmm. a, a lot of young people that I've seen, that I've met lately, their passion is um, producing food that is not corporate, mm -hmm. and, 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 and building that system. Cool, right? Um, myself, my passion has always been um, militarism, fighting militarism and racism. In all cases, though, whatever we do, we have to organize toward power. And so what I've said, as, as, as what I think our goal has got to be in the next 20 to 40 years, is to take over the Democratic Party and make it a party of the people, which is, in a way, kind of the brand that it, is, that it should be mm -hmm. coming out of the New Deal. And, 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 and to take it out of the hands of the corporate interests, the oligarchy that, that owns both the Democratic and Republican parties. So myself, I'm working in New Mexico um, in an effort to build a progressive wing of the Democratic Party, and 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 I think this is going to have to happen everywhere. Um, a lot of us, I've resisted this for most of my life. Mm. I've thought it, it's filthy to work with the Democratic Party. I don't like to sit in the same room with these scumbags and opportunists and careerists. I mean, if I were to tell you about the the people in New Mexico, the politicians in New, well, you've heard of Bill Richardson. Mm. Ah! You know? but, but we've got to take back that party because the issue of power is a key one. To get to power, though, we've got to do base level organizing, I think community organizing, and that takes a lot of these old and new skills, the use of the internet as, as you're pioneering, and, and also the, the use of, uh, of the old, uh, old uh, models of knocking on doors to talk to your neighbors. So, I mean, this is a long uh, effort that we're involved in. I think we're just at the beginning. Well, on that note, thank you very much. Well, it was a you. pleasure. Thank you, Jim. Thank you.